remember that childhood bike? Did you have that bike that was had the banana seed on it? That might give you a little clue as to what your age is. Did you have the one that was really colorful with the ribbons on the side and the magic bell that you rang? Uh, what kind of bike did you have? Did you have that four speed? Did you have the one that 10 speed that enabled you to be the racer? Uh, uh, and maybe it was for more exercise and fitness that you had a bike. Whatever it is, you all remember the bike and the bike wheel. There you go, right here on the picture you see the very wheel with the rim, the spokes, and the hub, very key components. As we picture the bicycle wheel with its many spokes all radiating out from that center hub and attached to that outer rim, well, it's a great visual. It's a visual for our world and our relationship to God and one another. For the hub, that very center of the wheel, is the very core that every spoke comes together on. And it's from that, that very hub that every spoke spreads out. And for every spoke is attached then and surrounded by that rim. And this very visual for us, as we see here on the screen, describes the very relationship that we have with one another and with God. For God being that very core, we being the spokes that extend outward. We realize that this visual really describes for us that we are really all created by God. We come from one source. We come from one place. We're all created in God's image, and we're all one. And that hub is the very core or source that we radiate from. When we embrace this, then we really understand this is what the oneness, when we use that word oneness, what it really means for us. And what oneness is in the world, it's everyone coming together, united in that very divine presence, coming together in that one awareness, coming together in oneness of understanding there is just one God, one creation, there's just one body, the very body of Christ. Now, though we may be different as we spread out from that very core or that hub, the more we spread further away, uh, we see those differences, but yet the more we come closer and closer together to that core, we're going to find commonalities. We're going to find those things that bring us together into that sense of oneness. And as we move closer and closer to that hub, as we get to that hub in our lives, that center really reminds us of the place where we all come together in a sense of harmony, unity, oneness with one another. This is what Jesus prayed. He prayed a prayer, Lord, let them see that they are one. Let the disciples, let the world come to this wonderful understanding that we all come together in a sense of oneness. Let them see this oneness just as you and I, O oh Lord, are one. For his desire was that the world would move closer to the center and realize that there is where we experience our highest and best. Acts chapter 17, verse 28 describes it this way. It says, for in God, for in that center, in that hub, when we come together, we live and move and have our being, and even as some of our own poets have said, for we too are God's offspring. What a beautiful passage. We live, we move, we have our very being, we understand. It. When we come together at that very center core, when we come together in God, we understand purpose. We understand what we do here in this world. We understand what life is all meant to be about. You live, and I live, move, have our true existence. We come together in that hub, that very core. Yet so much of our lives as human beings, we've tried to find our place out on the rim, out on the very extended places, for our world highlights constantly, oh, you're so different, you're, you're so unique. Highlights our individualism and constantly refers how separate we are in the world, as if that's the most important thing, to be separate. As if somehow it would be a bad thing to be one. The material or physical world sees life out on the rim versus inviting us to come together in a sense of oneness. Now when we make that shift from that kind of separation thinking to coming together, there is something amazing that happens. There is a transformation that brings about something called connection or oneness. In oneness there is love. 
In oneness, there's compassion. In oneness, there's grace and forgiveness and patience. In oneness, there's mercy, peace, joy, and so much more. And actually, this is what church is all about. You came here today to experience oneness. That's what you came for. We really came here to experience that very oneness of connectedness, of coming together in purpose and intention, of commonality. And truly, this is what church is all about. It's about coming from a world of separateness to a sanctuary of connectedness. Coming from a world of division that sees only its differences to a place where we see our oneness. It's about an experience where we come together with the same desire to get to the hub, to get to the center, to come into awareness with God and to come into that awareness with one another. And when we do this, something amazing happens. We come into one accord. There is a real sense of unitedness, a unity. There's a harmony that happens in the spiritual environment. There's no fighting or drama or arguments or negativity for all that that may seem to be opposition to unity. It's gone. And so let us stay together. I'm here for no other reason than to be one with God and one another. Oh, that's a big statement. Can we say it together? I'm here for no other reason than to be one with God and one another. That's what church is. That's what this sanctuary is all about. We don't come from the cares of this world to bring the cares of this world into this environment, but we come from the cares of the world to leave them behind and to experience that oneness, coming together to the core, coming together in oneness with one another to such experience that we are uplifted, encouraged, blessed, touched, moved. We feel the very presence of God that empowers us. And when we hear of someone who is out on the rim, they've gone, gone away from that core or center, and their desire is to create separation or fear or division, what do we do? What do we do? Well, we work the healing work and ministry of Jesus. That's what we do. Matthew chapter 18 gave us some clear designs for us clear understanding for how we do the work and the ministry of healing within the body for those who may have slipped away from the core and living out on the rim or the very edges of the world those who've lost sight of that connectedness and oneness of the spirit of presence within each one what do we do well very clearly in the passage of scripture jesus to buy has lays out a healing plan for our lives we hear of someone who's hurting or speaking in some sort of way that would be contrary to the blessing and goodness, we reach out to them. For we hear them hurting, and hurting people hurt others. But we go to them with such love and compassion. We reach out to them, for we see that they're hurting, and we go to provide opportunities to facilitate healing. It's like, I know each and every one of you, that if someone said, oh, I've got a headache, or oh, I've got a pain, or oh, I cut myself. You'd be the first to run. Let me get a Band-Aid. Oh, I think I've got an aspirin in my purse. Oh, you're not feeling well. Let me pray for you right now because I want to facilitate a healing work within your life. I know that that's the kind of loving people you are. And it's just the same when we hear of someone hurting or speaking in ways that can be damaging to the body, harmful to one another, creating drama, creating chaos in the world. What do we do? Oh, we respond instantly with the healing ministry that Jesus laid out for us to follow. We go to them instantly and say, if you're hurting and you're saying, oh, you're talking about Biff. Heather's talking about Biff. What am I going to do? I'm going to say to Heather, Heather, come with me right now. You know, we're going to go to talk to Biff, and if you have a problem with him, we're going to work it out right now. Why? Because I can't, as, as a, a follower of, of Jesus, I can't allow for you to live one day without this healing in your life. Why would I let you be hurt and go on? How silly that would be. We would be no different than the story of the Good Samaritan. You know that biblical story where the man is beaten up on the roadside and people come by and go, oh, wait a minute, I'm too busy to bother with you to reach out and heal you. Oh, I'm too busy to care for you. And if I do, I'll get involved. And oh, that could be messy. Oh, there might be all kinds of problems for me. Instead, I'm just going to move on by and pretend like it doesn't exist. But no, there was a Good Samaritan who stopped and said, I see this pain. Heather and Biff, oh, there's a problem. I know you don't have it, but I'm using it as a beautiful illustration today. I'm going to see that 
There is a healing going on in your heart and life right now. I'm not going to pass you by. In fact, I'm going to say, Heather, let's go to Biff right now. Or I'm going to give you 48 hours. And in 48 hours, if you haven't gone to Biff, I'm going to go with you. And I'll help you find that healing that you need in your life. A conversation of understanding and compassion. Opening your heart to one another. Wow, what an amazing experience that would be. Not only for Heather, but for Biff. Not only for Biff, but also for Heather. And suddenly, we're following a scriptural plan that God has laid out for healing and wholeness in the body of Christ. Why? Because God's intention is there should never be a day where you're not in oneness. There's never a day when you're not living in the hub. There's never should be a day when you're not at the core of the wheel. But you've wandered all or slipped out to the rim and feeling separate or divided. That's not God's intention for your life. Now, we wouldn't want that for anyone else. We wouldn't want it for ourselves. So we hope and pray that when someone hears us hurting, they say, well, let me go and get you right now, and let's facilitate that healing right now because we want you to be at the core. Amen? That's the kind of people we are as we move and live in God's divine plan. That's Jesus' outline for healing within us, our lives, because we're committed to getting everyone to the center, everyone to experiencing the fullness of the divine. We can't allow that there's someone out there on the fringe and just let them be there for jesus even illustrated if there's one that is missing leave the 99 and go and get them and bring them in in the healing process let's go and reach out to them let's do this as the body of christ works together the healing ministry that jesus ordained for us at some point in our life we all have to move to that center for jesus said follow me where are we going Oh, we're following Jesus to the center, to the core, to the very presence of God. This is where Jesus is leading each and every one of us to get to that very hub in the story of the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. You may be familiar with that Bible story of Saul being the great persecutor, a Jew himself, but going about persecuting every Christian, trying to imprison them, trying to make their lives miserable, talking evil about them in all ways, trying to make sure that their lives were celebrating a separateness, that Jews were different than them, that there was nothing that they would share. There was no sense of celebration together in oneness. And Saul spent his days making life miserable for every church person. Then one day on the road to Damascus, he was struck by a light. Whether that may be lightning or something, I had the opportunity of traveling to Israel and on that road to Damascus. They say it's because of its location and its altitude that there are numerous lightning strikes that happen there. It's a very energized location. Whatever it may be, Saul had this experience of awakening in his life. And from that moment, as he was hit by this light and fell off his high, high horse, literally, and landed on the ground, something transformed within his heart and life. And he came to understand and realize, wait a minute, that which I've been persecuting may be out of line. And a change and a transformation came with him. A change so great that he changed his name from Saul to Paul. And he went about in a new ministry known today as the Apostle Paul, one who is transforming the church with the good news. He had this experience that changed him as he came and discovered God as the very core of his life. Several years ago, a man went to a therapist and he just shared his story with me. He said, I've been seeing a therapist for so long because I've really been trying to uh, work on relationships and I just can't seem to have a relationship that works for me. You know, I meet somebody wonderful, I think they're fabulous, we get in, you know, just all of those wonderful moments of, you know, rushing to relationships, and we're already picking out the china on the third date. Oh, please tell me that's not a few of you. Uh, But you know how it is. You got your U-Haul ready to go, move in on the second date. You're ready to just kind of, just rush into these relationships, so excited about the possibilities, and then what happens? Two weeks later, three weeks later, the relationships, ah didn't work out at the therapist every week he would share these stories and one day the therapist therapist said you know the real answer you've been trying to fill that hole in your life 
because you've always been expecting someone else to fill it instead of you. Relationships, other people, they can't fill that void of love within our own hearts and lives. We've got to stop and do the work ourselves. We've got to say, wait a minute, what's the void here? What's the hole? What's the gap? Let me fill that first so that I can radiate from that. Let me get from the rim all the way down to the hub. Let me get into that wonderful source of love that is God divine. Let me allow that to work within my heart and life and fill that void. And when I do, suddenly all the relationships and how I see relationships, well, they're different. They're transformed. For the answers we discover are not out on the rim. The answers are found at the core. We find then that is our soul may want to get to the center, but the outer world tries to pull us away and we kind of get sucked back from them. You know, we have good intentions. Oh, I want to be centered in God. Oh, every day I want to wake up to that oneness. Oh, every day I want to be just completely walking in the divine presence. And then somehow things just in life begin to pull us away from the core. And we spend the day out on the rim. We get sucked out there so easily, don't we? There's a man who was uh, a student of a great guru. And the guru said to him, if you really want to encounter God, I want you to sit under the tree and just spend your days meditating, centered in this wonderful divine presence. And I'm going to give you two things, a begging bowl and a loincloth. Oh, he ventured out to the tree out by the riverbank and there he sat in the stillness and enjoyed the wonderful day of meditation and felt he was hungry so he thought he'd go into town with his simple beggar's bowl and he begged for food to, and finances to help support him for the day's nourishment he went back and that night he thought I'm going to wash out my loincloth and set it out to dry the next morning when he woke up underneath the tree ready to meditate and spend the day oh he noticed a rat had chewed up his loincloth. Now I have nothing. How embarrassing. Now I must go to town. I got to go to town and I got to beg not only for food, but I got to beg for a loincloth too. Oh, this is really uncomfortable and embarrassing. He spent the day. He got the funds he needed for food. He got the loincloth and returned back. The day was hot and sweaty. He thought, I'm going to rinse out this loincloth and I'll set it aside and wake up in the morning and we'll begin a new day of meditation and prayer. I'm gonna, I'll get back on course and I'm going to be so centered with God and only to wake up in the morning and discover, ah, that rat, he's chewed up my loincloth again. What now? This time I'm going into town. I've got the answer. I'll get a cat. I'm getting a cat, and that will solve the problem. He got the cat, brought it home, and realized, wait a minute, now the cat needs milk. Okay, now what am I going to do? I, you know, I can't spend my day. I, 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 I got the loincloth, I got the begging bowl, I got to take care of the cat. Now, I'll get a cow. I got the cow, that's what I've got. The cow will provide the milk, and that should solve every problem, except for, wait a minute, the cow needs to be fed, and I've got to get more hay, and uh, how am I going to do that? I'll get a farm. I've got a farm. I've got a farm to take care of the hay, to take care of the cow. The cow will provide the milk. The milk will provide for the cat. The cat will take care of the, the rat. We'll have the loincloth, and I'll be able to meditate. It'll be wonderful. Only to realize that the farm required maintenance, and so he had to hire workers. And now I've got the workers to handle the farm, to take care of the cow, to take care of the milk, to take care of the cat, to take care of the rat. Ah, oh, this is what the workers demanded attention. I'll get a wife. She'll take care of the workers. Woman's work. She'll take care of it. She'll manage them all. She'll get them all organized. How wonderful that will be. And so he got the wife, and that was just the perfect answer. Only she says, I can't live under the tree. I gotta have a house. So we'll get a house. We got a house, a big house, because honey, I'm pregnant. Okay, so now we've got a pregnant wife. We're living in a big house who's managing the workers, who's got a farm with all the workers on it, and we're taking care of the, the cow, and we're taking care of the milk, and we're taking care of the cat, only so I can have a moment of meditation and time to pray. Wait a minute. And one day, in all the hecticness, his teacher comes by and says, Wait a minute. Are you my student? Are you the one I left under the tree and said, spend your day in meditation to understand God? Are you that? 
how did you get here? How, what happened to you? How did you? How can you meditate? Did not that leave you with just a bowl and a loincloth? And he said, "Oh, teacher, let me explain. All of this was the only way I could keep my loincloth." When we think about it in life, we're called to pray, to be centered, to be in relationship, to be in oneness. But how true it is that everything wants to pull us away, distract us, take us away from the very core, pull us out to the rim. And our lives are so different than our great intention may have been, our, the calling of our life to be so centered on a day-to-day -day basis. We must work and not allow life to pull us away from the center. We've got to express some level of commitment that says, I'm committed no matter what. No matter what happens within the journey of my life, this is what's most valuable, that I remain centered in the very core, that I'm in the presence of God each and every day. There's a Bible story of Elijah. Elijah was overseeing the children of Israel. Everything seemed to be going so good for his ministry. Then there was Queen Jezebel. And she had brought into uh, the community of Israel the worship of a foreign god, a Baal. And Elijah's intention was to bring Israel back. Let's get back to the core. Let's get back to God. And so he began to go through the community and destroy, destroy the prophets, destroy the idols, destroy the temples, all that had been for worship of Baal. And the angry queen, Jezebel, said, I'll get you. You destroy my gods and my idols and my prophets. I'll get you tit for tat. I'll destroy you. I'm coming out for you. I'm going to get you, Elijah. And Elijah, in great fear, begins to run off, fleeing for his life. And Scripture says that he goes a day's journey into the wilderness. Very symbolic because where he went to was a wilderness. That wilderness is the place that we go in our lives where it's the woe is me, confusion, depression, sadness, and worst of all, victimless. Oh, you don't understand how horrible my life is and all the things I've got. I was doing so well. I was everything. I was here just being a victor for God, destroying idols, and now the queen is after me. She wants to kill me, and oh, you know, I've always me, and oh, my life is so bad. I just want to die. I just want to die. Sometimes that story is our story. We want to live in victimness of all the hurt and pain of the world coming against us because, well, honestly, we're too far out on the limb. And Elijah, in his victimness, doesn't know what to do, and so he just cries out, I just want to die. I've done all this, and now no one appreciates me. No one loves me. Poor, poor me. And he sits under the tree, and an angel comes. An angel, a messenger, and brings him food and ministers to him and simply says to him, Elijah, here's what you gotta do. You gotta rise up and go to a higher place. You gotta rise up and go to a higher place. You're here in this victimization. There's a higher plane for you, a better place for you. You've got to leave. You've been kind of living out on the rim, and it's time to move to the core, to that higher place. And so Elijah gets up and moves to climb and go towards Mount Horeb. And on his journey there, he finds himself in a cave, a cave of all places. And the symbolism of that cave is he goes back to a place of darkness. Even in his desire to rise to a higher place, he's trying his effort, but he still goes back and well, goes into that centeredness of darkness. And there in the darkness, the story unfolds that God whispers to him and says, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing? What are you doing in this place of darkness? Why are you doing in this cave? Why have you brought yourself to this life of hurt and self-pity and all the stuff that's going on in your life? Why are you doing that? You don't need to. In fact, he says, just step out and you're going to see and experience all of Elijah does come out to the cave and out there the cave suddenly a mighty wind comes but God is not in the wind oh, and then an earthquake and the earth shakes and what God's not in the earthquake either 
And then there's fire. Oh, of course, God. No, God's not in the fire either. And then there's the still, small voice. And God is in the still, small voice. It simply whispers and speaks to our heart. When we're in our deepest places of woundedness and hurt, when we're in those places of pity or victimization, when we're in those places we'd like to lash out at the world, the very essence of this passage is saying, go to the pool. Discover once again in that still small voice, God is speaking to you of immense love, care, and compassion that God desires for your individual life. Now, too often, you know, we forget this stillness. We forget that that's the simplicity of God for our individual lives. There's a story of Sherlock Holmes and Watson. Well, they would decide to go on a camping trip. And they lay stretched out underneath the stars at night and looking up at the heavens. And Holmes turns to Watson and says, Watson, what do you see? Watson, wanting to expound so eloquently to Holmes. Well, I see millions of stars, a whole universe of infinite possibilities. And feeling quite smart and clever in his response. He turned to Holmes and said, now what do you see? Holmes simply said, I see that somebody stole our tent. That's all it is. We're out here looking at stars because somebody stole our tent. It's as simple as that, and too often this is the story, the moral for our lives is that it's just that simple. Someone may have stolen that which is your covering, that which is your shelter. Someone may have taken you away from the core and you're out on the whim. And it's just as simple as that to come back and to find that peace, to go to the center, to get to the hub, to that stillness where God is there to meet every need and to heal your wounded heart, your hurting place, and to make you whole. Matthew chapter 6 tells us this divine plan of God for us in our prayer life, us how we get to the hub. How do we get there? You want to know how? Well, Jesus laid it out for us. Aren't you glad? Jesus is a great teacher. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we paid a little attention to the teaching of Jesus? How our lives might change. Matthew chapter 6 tells us, when you pray, go to that inner chamber. Go to your closet. Now, contrary to what this church is all about, we're trying to get you out of your closet. Here we find a passage that says, go into the closet. What we're really saying here is it's not a space, it's not a room, it's not a corner, it's your house, it's not your sacred altar space. That sacred chamber is right in here. Because when you come out, you come out from not a physical space. You come out from in here with self-acceptance and love for yourself. And when you go to that chamber, that innermost secret place, you go within, and you go deep within to find and discover. That's the place where I find God. Jesus is saying, when you pray, this is what you do. You shut the door of all the distractions and all the chaos and everything else that's going on around you. And all the wah, 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 wah. You just close it all out. You stop listening to someone else's complaining and whining. And not that you ignore it because you've already done the healing work with them. But you work on your own self and say, I am now going into that centered place, that secret place. This is where I shut the door, and that is to get off the rim, to go, let go of the distractions and get to the center, and I go to God. Now, wait a minute. God is always with us, right? We love that scripture. God will never leave us nor forsake us. God will never, ever be away from us. There is no distance. There is no separation. But wait a minute. I'm... Suddenly, we're going to God. What does that mean to go to God? Well, we quiet our hearts, and when we do, whew, we rest. We move to the hub. We come to the center quickly. We discover we, that's where God is and waiting for us. We quiet our thought, and we welcome God's thoughts. We quiet our woundedness and welcome God's healing. We go deeper and higher. Ooh, wait a minute. Deeper? And higher? 
what? That seems like such a craziness. Yet what we're really describing is for us that we go deep inside God when we the very stillness. Elijah thought God would be in the earthquake. Certainly God is in the wind. Certainly God's in the fire. Certainly God's in all these big and great and mighty things, but God is deep within the very core. And when we get there, that's where the transformation is. We go deep inside to God and we listen. And the more we listen, well, the higher we go. We move to higher levels of understanding. And we're awakened to all that God has for us. We go deeper to get higher. And how amazing that is when we come to the center and realize this is where I belong, where I need to stay every single day. And I need some sort of commitment in my own life to be there at every moment because I'm going to go deeper and higher with God. There was a spiritual teacher who came to a village. And everyone was in awe of He seemed to manifest nothing but love, grace, mercy, peace. Oh, there was nothing but joy to be around him. There was nothing but forgiveness, patience, goodness. And the villagers were so moved that they didn't ask who he was. They stopped and asked, what are you? Are you an angel? Are you an angel that you manifest such beautiful things? Are you God? Because what we feel is this mighty presence all around you. He said, no, I'm not an angel. and No, I'm not God. I'm simply one who is awakened. Wow. So simply to be awake to what God is and what God wants to do in and through our lives. See what happens when we move from the rim to the hub? We're awakened. We're awakened to something dynamic and special that has been waiting to transpire within our lives. We're awakened to this amazing thing. What our challenge is as we journey through the season of renewal at City of Light and we look at these different attributes of openness and positivity and receptivity, today we're talking about commitment. And our calling as people of God is to make a commitment to be at the center every day, to leave the rim and go to the hub, to leave the world of all of its cares and come to this place of oneness with one another and with God. For it is there that we make this commitment that our lives are changed and transformed. Our church, our community is changed and transformed. We changed our name to City of Light, and some people said to me, well, Pastor, it's wonderful you changed your name. Uh, the church has chosen a new direction, but how will we be City of Light? What, what, how? How is it? What's the difference now? What, what's changed? Here's how. When we make a daily commitment to get off the rim and move to the center, we make a daily commitment that we rush to get to the center. No, we run to get to the center. No, with all urgency and tensions, we're committed to stay there and we don't have to run to or rush to, but we're there every single day of our lives. It is then that our light will shine. It is then that we'll transform the world because we're one with God and every day we live with it. So this morning I ask you, are you ready to go to the center? Are you ready to go to the hub? If you are, I'd like you to stand and make that commitment. Stand if you're ready and allow the Spirit of God to speak to you. I'll say, yes, I'm ready. I want to move to the hub in my life. I want to move to that place. I want to be there each and every day of my life, one with God. And this is your desire. Would you pray with me now? Loving God, as we stand across this room, we express our commitment, our intention and desire. Every day, we want to live in you. And every day, as the world may pull us, it is our desire and intention to say, no, we will not be pulled. 
We are committed to staying in oneness with God and with one another. And there is nothing, nothing, nothing that can pull us away. For our focus, our intention, and our commitment is great. We know then as you work through each and every one who expresses that desire, that we are going to be a light, a beacon for the world, a city of light for all the world to see. A city of light, of understanding and truth that all may experience. And we thank you for it now. Bless us now as we voice this commitment. Bless us now with strength, power, and intention. Bless us now as we move forward with it, for we know that this is our moment of transformation. And we thank you for it. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated.